Well, welcome to Bookish, everybody, on this cold and freezing Friday night. We're your virtual program on authors, thinkers, and the literary life, brought to you by the Southern California News Group and the Bay Area News Group. I'm Sam Dunn. I'm the senior editor of premium content at SCNG and a book nerd myself. Uh, I want to say thank you to our Reader Reward subscribers and really to, to all of you who've made our ongoing virtual program so popular. And, you know, if you're not a subscriber, why not? Just go to scng.com forward slash subscribe and find your local paper and join us. Uh, and by the way, if you're a Reader Rewards member uh, attending tonight, you're automatically entered to win a $50 gift card from our partner and one of our favorite independent bookstores in Los Angeles County, Once Upon a Time. And just so you know, you can get signed copies of books by today's authors from them. And wait, before, before I say anything more, I forgot, we also have a new books newsletter uh, edited by our wonderful uh, books editor, Eric Peterson, who's here tonight, by the way, behind the curtain. Uh, so sign up. Anyway, before we get started, here are a couple things to know. Um, audience members, uh, because there's so very many of you, you're muted to allow for the free flow of conversation among the featured guests. But if you have questions, and really, we hope you do, please use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Um, if you just want to add a comment or talk to other people, use the chat feature also found there on your screen. We're going to be monitoring questions. Eric is behind the scenes and uh, also the comments and we'll respond as much as possible. Just so you know, this session is videotaped and a link is going to be sent to you so you can share or just revisit some of your favorite moments. It's also posted at scng.com forward slash virtual events. And that's where you can find all of our past virtual shows, as well as see what's coming Coming up in 2022. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our beloved bookish host. She is a writer, performer, and radio commentator. You might know her from her work on NPR's Morning Edition and This American Life. She is a contributing editor to The Atlantic and host of the syndicated daily radio Minute, The Lowdown on Science. She is the author of many, many books, but her most recent is The Mad Woman and the Roomba. Beaming to us from bohemian splendor in Pasadena, please welcome my friend Sandra Singlo. Hey, girl. Hello, it's so cold. This is it's so sweater cold. only. It's so cold. I it's know, like, I've got my little wrap behind 42. me. 42, so what's going on? All, all right, <laughs> well, although it is cold, we're going to get warm and fuzzy um, on this section because uh, it's largely, not totally, our, our book is largely about animals. And today I am going to out you, Samantha Dunn. I'm pointing at my screen as an animal person. You are the most animalish if we can say person that i know yeah. can you i am help freakishly help? freakishly i have so many mouths to feed it's ridiculous i'm yes. like old mother hubbard um yeah. horses goats dogs cats we had a beta fish who lasted a long time alas r.i.p he didn't make it and our dear pig died last year as well so yes i have a lot of mouths to feed and you can see actually i'm beaming to you from our barn office well not technically the barn um at at the horse property Right. And you just came back from Africa, so. Um, yes, and I just came back from safari in Africa where I saw lions and tigers, no bears. <laughs> no bears, no bears. Great, well. Okay, I'm gonna get out of here. A thing or two when we go forth because we're gonna talk a lot about animals today. You might learn something interesting. And about that other animal known as your son, your adolescent. I can't, God, I can't wait. Okay, I'll, I'll <laughs> okay. let you get to it. Bye. All right, all right. Uh, first up today on Bookish, we're really delighted to have Susan Orlean, the 32nd download. Susan Orlean has been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 1992 and has also written for Vogue, Rolling Stone, Esquire, and Outside. She's the author of seven books, including, amongst others, Rin Tin Tin, The Saturday, uh, Saturday Night, The Library Book, and The Orchid Thief, which was made into the Academy Award-winning film adaptation starring Meryl Streep and Nicolas Cage. Mostly Meryl Streep for fans of Meryl. Currently, she writes a weekly column for Medium, runs a book club on literati, and does some television writing, including a stint on How To with John Wilson on HBO and the forthcoming adaptation of The Library Book, her newest book, an amazing collection on animals. Welcome, Susan. I'm so happy to be with you. And oh. I'm so cold. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're also in California right now, right? So. I am, and okay. it's very chilly. Yeah, I know. Okay, well, you've brilliantly covered so many topics, orchids, libraries, Saturday nights, to name a few, but um, 
Susan, can you tell our viewers about the first book you ever wrote? It's true. I mean, On Animals may be the culmination of my <clears throat> writing career about animals, but it was hardly the first. As a young, young person, and family legend has it that I was four or five years old, I wrote my first book, and it was called Herbert the Nearsighted Pigeon. It was about a nearsighted pigeon who <clears throat> is experiencing relationship difficulties because he can't see his friends. Um, the book was written in an edition of one, um, <laughs> and it was written in pencil, probably on scratch paper from my mom's desk. But, and you know, I would say that it's a, a now would be considered a rare book. <laughs> so rare, uh, original first edition. And, and, you, and, and you, what, the, the question is what continues to fascinate you about animals, but there's a quote from John Berger in the, in the front of your book, animals first entered the imagination as messengers and promises is, uh, that resonates with you, right? Oh, very much. I think that in animals, we both see human emotion, human behavior, and yet something also very strange and very unknowable. So there, there's a quality that's both familiar and, and exotic about animals. We can't ever fully know them and yet we can develop a relationship with them. And I think that there is something amazing. I mean, each time my dog sits, when I tell him to sit, I'm sort of amazed. I've communicated with this other being that is not a human. And we both understand the transaction, which is that I'm asking him to sit down. It's also true that these stories, even though they're about animals, are very much an excuse for looking at human behavior. None of these stories are about an animal absent from the, the human world. And in fact, most of these stories are about the somewhat awkward and uneasy interaction between humans and animals. And to me, that's really fascinating. I mean, I'm fascinated by humans interacting with humans, but somehow humans interacting with animals, you, you have a, a kind of nakedness of behavior that to me is really compelling to observe and describe. So to dive into detail a little bit here, um, and of course you lived in upstate New York or do, and then moved to LA for a while and really compared these two ecosystems, which was really fascinating for some where coyotes are picking off chickens here all the time, as you mentioned. Um, and uh, so what I, what I wanna ask you about is, as I told Samantha, chickens. Your section on chickens of why chickens were not hip for a while and then suddenly they came into vogue and everyone wanted chickens. Can you describe that a little bit? To you? you know, it's so funny. And I mentioned this in my story about chickens. Of all of the acquisitions or achievements in my life that I have described to friends, nothing has been more a source of envy than when I got chickens. And everybody had the same reaction, which was, oh, I really want chickens. And it was almost across the board, the reaction. And, you know, I've said things like I found a wonderful husband and I had a baby and I, I and nobody. It's somehow wanting chickens became a source of incredible desire and passion. And the reason that I wrote a lot about them and use as the first story in the book, a piece I did about backyard chickens was because it was such a, a social moment. We reclaimed this very, very humble 
enterprise, which is raising chickens. I mean, there's never been any glamour associated with chickens versus having cattle. You know, cattle, it's a evidence of great wealth and, so, you know, it's sort of bragging rights. I have 2000 head of cattle. No one has ever bragged about their chickens. It's, it's always been a very humble, um, very modest sort of farming. And interestingly, it's also something that has um, very often been relegated to women. It used to be on a farm that women would keep a little garden with herbs and lettuce and tomatoes, and they'd have a couple chickens. It was sort of thought of as women's farming. Um, I think that we got passionate about chickens because of several concurrent events. Number one, an interest in knowing where your food came from. And suddenly the idea that you would know where your eggs were from became very appealing. Secondly, this desire to reclaim um, kind of artisanal things. You know, to me, Martha Stewart, right? Very <laughs> Martha Stewart, very, uh, very pandemic. I'm going to bake my own sourdough bread. I'm going to make my own yogurt and I'm going to have chickens and go collect eggs in the morning. And, you know, you don't raise chickens. Um, you don't need it to be a commercial enterprise. You right. can have two chickens, three chickens, gather the eggs in the morning and just have eggs for your family. It's a, and it's a very easy thing to do. Um, to be honest, really, it's so easy that children often were tasked with taking care of the chickens on a farm because it doesn't require anything. It's not like milking a cow that really is sort of an, uh, an effort, something so that... Uh, and yeah, no, that's entirely fascinating. And I should say overall, there's so much in the book that's amazing. People just have to get it if they haven't already. The lady who raises tigers, et cetera. It, it, it's, it's a fascinating book, but we have our readers um, on, on the chat. They really have an enduring interest in the library book um, from Dixie Matheson, uh, Patricia Downing, Anxious to hear about her research for the library book, your experience in, <coughs> in, in doing that. If you could say a few words about that. Oh, sure. Um, you know, this was a seven year process that uh, began very accidentally, very, it was serendipity that um, I was being given a tour of the library and someone casually mentioned the fire. I was new to LA. I didn't know anything about the history of LA, the history of the library. I'm proud to say I knew very little about arson. Um, you know, not my hobby. And I dove into, I, I probably researched for four and a half years and then wrote for two and a half. And I had, I, I was trying to learn everything I could about the library, as well as everything I could learn about this catastrophe, the, the burning of the downtown library, but also to spend time in the library of today and, and kind of have the phoenix rising from the ashes to write about the day-to-day -day life in the library as it is now. So I talked to dozens and dozens of people, former head librarians, former um, millions of patrons, um, the, certainly the, the docents that are really, <clears throat> excuse me, who know the library backward and forward, people who were involved in this enormous effort to raise money to rebuild the library after the fire and replace 
the 400,000 books that were destroyed. So there were just so many people and my morning would begin with me interviewing a firefighter, then it would be a librarian, then I would go to the library and spend several hours in the children's department, uh, then you know, do another dive into learning about um, one of the head librarians from the 1930s. So it was, it was a fascinating and incredibly broad learning experience for me. I also, toward the end of my reporting and where I thought I'd really covered all the bases, found 46 boxes of archives at the library that dated from the very beginning of the library. So right when I thought I had finished my reporting, I came across these boxes of material. So it set me back a little bit, but it was great, great material. So I can't complain. So uh, another great book, and I wish we had more time, not just to talk, but to watch the sun set gently behind you. Uh, oh. So anyway, all of your books are fantastic. Uh, the great Susan Orlean, her wonderful new collection on animals is just out. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for, for having me join you today. It was such a pleasure. And, and if I could have in the chat, and I'll have Samantha arrange it, um, Katie Loss has a question about your next topic, but maybe I can have Samantha do it in the chat because, yes, because it's fascinating. I know a memoir is next. Yes, a yes. memoir is next. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Enjoy, enjoy your evening. Thanks, Sandra. All right, next up on Bookish, Barbara Natterson Hor Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz, the 32nd download. B. Natterson Horowitz, MD, as she's sometimes known, is a cardiologist and evolutionary biologist who divides her time between UCLA and Harvard, where she teaches at the medical school and Department of Human Evolutionary Biology. Co-authored with Katherine Bowers, her New York Times bestseller, Zubiquity, What Animals Can Teach Us About Health and the Science of Healing, was a Smithsonian top book of 2012 and a Discover Magazine best book of the year. In 2019, check this out, Bio-Inspired Medicine was selected by the Nobel Assembly as the theme of its Nobel Conference. Natterson Horowitz delivered the opening keynote address. That year, again with Bowers, she published Wildhood, the epic journey from adolescence to adulthood in humans and other animals, now in paperback. Welcome, Barbara. I'm so, so excited to be here and really honored to follow Susan Orlin. My gosh. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and animals, which is the topic of, of, of the day. Well, um, and I know you've given so many great talks on, on I just want to unleash you, but let me start by saying, yes, adolescence and Samantha, who has a son who's turning 13, mine are 19 and 21. So um, adolescence can certainly be a time where people were particularly parents go, no, let it not happen. Let them just go to bed at age 12 and then get up again at age 40 and just sleep through it. Middle school is horrible, but not quite according to your book. It's a bit of a grand adventure. Can you set that up for our viewers a bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, when we think about similarities between humans and animals, uh, they typically fall into two categories, right? So you go to a natural history museum, you see the dinosaurs, and you sort of see how those ribs uh, connect to the to the vertebra, and you're like, oh, that looks pretty similar. Okay, I, that looks like I get that. I see the connection between humans and dinosaurs. Or you um, you hear these things like 70% uh, of the genes that are um, related to human mental illness also exist in zebra fish and it's like whoa that's really interesting so so it's sort of it's sort of there are these specific familiar ways in which we connect humans and other animals but developmentally in other words phase of life comparisons you don't typically hear about that and so um I should just give a little bit of background that I spent the first 25 years of my life as a physician, as a professor of medicine and a cardiologist, and actually a psychiatrist as well. But um, over the last almost 15 years now, along with uh, my writing and research partner, Catherine Bowers, we've been turning to the natural world for insights into human health and development. And we started wondering about uh, the developmental phase of life that people wring their hands over more than any, which 
uh, is adolescence. And, you know, it's the fact that both of us happened to have had adolescence at that time was, you know, it didn't hurt in motiv motivating us to move in that direction. Um, but I have to say that I had actually heard for years, and I don't remember exactly when, that adolescence was the product of, you know, post-industrial society, or that, you know, human adolescence was created by some modern phenomenon. And so, um, that those kinds of um, ideas, uh, what what I'd learned over the last you know ten years before we we started writing this book was that there is so much um, unexamined assumption about human uniqueness. There's and and when it comes to um, medicine, my God, it's just completely dripping with this kind of human exceptionalism. And as it turned out. It was completely the case when it came to thinking about adolescence. So the um, so we got really interested. Catherine and I got really interested in what we actually could not only learn about animal adolescence, but how similar were the challenges of animal adolescence to the challenges of human adolescence? And then even beyond that, um, were there insights? that we could take from the animal world and bring back to the human world. So that was sort of how this all got started. Yeah, it's stunning. And I think you mentioned it's over 600 million years old, right? Adolescence. Right. It's super, it's it's all older than time itself. Um, so I wonder if you could lay out in adolescence what you know you call the, the four fundamental challenges of what of wildhood, what you call wildhood. And it's so fascinating if you could lay it out for people. Right. So so um, the first part of that is that whether you're looking at um, fish, reptiles, birds, or mammals, animals who are have just started puberty or are between the onset of puberty and the beginning of mature adult life share certain biological characteristics. I mean, specifically neurobiological characteristics. They have a they have an underestimation of risk. They literally underestimate risk. That coupled with when they do take risks, they get a greater hit of a dopamine pleasure reward. So their brains are in common. So whether you're an adolescent fish or an adolescent human, that's a commonality. And what that means is that they are more likely to take risks. And of course, what unfortunately that translates into is that they have a higher mortality. We know it's a very dangerous period in human life. That's why we get so worried as parents, um, you know, between the ages of like 11 and 19, human mortality increases over six times. I mean, it's really, really dangerous. So, um, so adolescents take greater risks, number one. And number two, they're inexperienced, right? So if you are um, unfamiliar with the environment, and you're no longer under the protection of your parents, you are easy prey. You are a target. And across species, across taxa, you see predators targeting adolescents. So these are animals that are just new. They're big enough to be outside of their parents' direct supervision, but they fall for everything. They're, they're what are, is called predator naive. And so they um, so these are characteristics that are uh, are pretty universal. And one of the um, first core competencies that you have to have if you are going to become a mature adult is you need to learn to be safe. So how wild animals move from being predator naive to being predator experienced is is fascinating. And one of the things they do is that they gather in groups and they approach danger. They literally approach their predators. It's called predator inspection. And while it's dangerous, it's believed to be critical to transform an inexperienced, predator, naive, knuckle-headed, adolescent wild animal into a savvy and safe adult. So that's number one. And quick passing question from one of our viewers, Jim Weaver, uh, in terms of defining adolescence in animals. Is it slightly different from each species or what? 
what you say to that? Right. So it's a great question because if you look at the definition on the human side, I mean, it varies depending on what domain you're looking at. So pediatricians have a different definition than the military, than the U.S. legal system. I mean, there's it's all over the place. But what we decided to do was to say, okay, the beginning is going to be the onset of puberty. And by the way, it turns out puberty is incredibly similar, whether you are a reptile, an amphibian, a bird, or a mammal. I mean, to be blunt, there's going to be a first erection. There's going to be a bunch of other firsts in terms of <laughs> you can, you, but, but I don't want to go. So the beginning of it is the onset of puberty, but the end of adolescence, we defined not as a chronological moment, but rather the acquisition of these four competencies, the first of which is learning to keep yourself safe. And by the way, in the wild, if an animal doesn't achieve all four of these competencies, they're not going to survive. But of course, in our species, that's not the case. All of us know people who are chronologic adults, but they may not have all of the core competencies. So that was good. <laughs> that's very nicely said. Yes, and that's a very delicate way. <laughs> to that peer thing. And I think that's an interesting point that you make, that you, you may see that the peer animals are leading them each other into danger, but it's a good practice. And you point out they learn more from their peers often than their parents because peers have more of that information. And I think with humans, so I think in, in reading your book, it's interestingly comforting because you say, well, we're like animals. Animals, but then that explains a lot of our behavior. If we have hormones and peers want to hang out the, with each other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think there, there was something that was so interesting about, I think, the social brain network um, and then how actually human adolescence, though, you know, uh, because of social media, it, it's a little harder on them. Can you explain that? Right. Section? So, so um, you know, the word status you know, outside of the world of, of behavioral ecology of animal behavior has a kind of negative connotation, right? We, but, but it turns out if you're a wild animal and you're a, wild, and, and you're a social species, your, your position in the group is, is really, really an important determinant of whether you're going to survive or not, whether you're going to have offspring. So, so not falling to the bottom of the heap, it literally is a matter of life and death for ad, for any animal and particularly for a young animal who's transitioning from being a juvenile to an adult. And so adolescent brains in among non-human animals, right? In the wild, by the way, that's our adolescent dog, Hadley. But <laughs> ad, that door was supposed to be closed. But adolescent animals have heightened sensitivity to status shifts, particularly to status decline, status descent it hurts, it's painful. And so what, what's interesting, what was personally interesting to me is that, um, is that when, I remember when my own kids, particularly my daughter would come home and she was bummed out about, you know, whatever happened socially that wasn't, she didn't feel good about. Um, the intensity of it, I would, I would feel like saying, and I'm sure I said something like, you know, this isn't a matter of life or death. But what I really now understand is that it, it feels like it's a matter of life or death, because we literally, you know, our, our brand new 200,000 year old species, right, is carrying this 600 million years of neurobiology that says, when your status falls, it is a matter of life or death. And so social media, which is, you know, a huge preoccupation of modern human adolescence. What the heck is it other than a big status contest where most of the time you lose? So there are ways in which I think this kind of ancient neurobiology, understanding it and, and where it comes from can help us decode some of our adolescent kids' behavior. And for me as a mom, actually, I, I think it could have made me, had I understood that, could have made me more a little bit more empathic maybe yeah and and i think the book is is so fascinating and resonates in in so many uh, different ways and i should tell people in, in the chat you know there's a lot of questions in the chat now about the four challenges and pure animals etc 
but uh, the time has just flown. We should do another one and then you can show all your video. Um, and I, I should say it is such a, but it's such a beautiful book because it tells the story. People should know of these four adolescent animals in their journeys and the emotions they feel. And, and it's really quite fascinating and, and, and actually comforting in a certain way. We're just like animals and, and, and so many interesting um, lessons from it. So, um, okay, so ah, if only we had, okay, the fantastic Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz, MD, uh, check out Barbara's website, her talks, and of course the book, all of the books, both of the books, amazing, um, and um, for the little adolescents among us all. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Thanks for having me, it's a lot of fun. Thank you, Barbara. And yes, and, and um, her latest book, which is now in paperback, is Wildhood. Uh, and, and it is really an epic adventure, we should say. And I should just add, it's Catherine Bowers and I are co-authors uh, yes. on both Zubik Witty and Wildhood. And, yes. And, and, and yes, it's a fantastic. And, and it is an epic adventure. And even, as you say, the dispersal, it, it is like the hero's journey or the heroine's journey. It's such a great book. I'm so glad. The, the, the central question, and when I look back on it, is uh, being a parent anyway of an adolescent is how much to lean in and how much to pull back. And one day we'll we'll figure that out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So our, our next guest here on Bookish um, is Natasha Dayong. Here's the 30 second download. Natasha Dayong is an NAC, NW. Double ACP Image Award nominee, practicing criminal attorney and professor at UCLA and Antioch University. Her novel Grace was named a best debut fiction by the American Library Association's Black Caucus, was named best book by the New York Times, a Pan America fellow. Dayon has been featured in Time Magazine, People Magazine, The Root, Red Book, New York Times, LA Times, American Short Fiction, BuzzFeed, and other places. She founded Redeemed, a criminal record clearing and clemency project that pairs writers with those who've been convicted of, been convicted of crimes. Her acclaimed new novel, just out on so many great lists, is The Perishing. Welcome, Natasha. Hey, oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I was listening to Dr. Barbara. I have a teen two teenagers and I was like, okay, I gotta take notes. Wait, no, what are the what is three and four? What is three? I am definitely gonna get the book and I'm so and then listening to Susan talk about the chickens, I was like, yeah, you know, you don't get good status, as Dr. Barbara would say, with chickens, right? It's kind of <laughs> but there is a pecking order, both books, said, and that is real. That's a real thing they pack down. Yes. And also, I know there, there was another question that, that Susan has named her chickens, so that's been <laughs> But to you, okay, and, and your book is is really amazing. It's It's astonishing. It's fascinating and it is, and how you wove it together, you know, the story of a black immortal in 1930s Los Angeles, amazing. But before we get to the book, I mean, can you talk a little bit about your journey to becoming a writer? Because you do, you have a day, you, you've done many other things. <laughs> you were gonna say you have a day job. Yes, I yes. <laughs> like You wouldn't need part. one, but you do. So <laughs> I do, I do, you know, I, I was born and raised in LA and I knew when my parents came from Alabama that I was gonna be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, period. That was sort of the great migration in their, in their teaching or tutelage to me. So there was never an opportunity for me to choose to be a writer. Um, so I chose law because it was a way for me to be able to tell stories and tell stories for others and to advocate for them. Um, and then when I was selected as a Pan America Fellow, that's where um, everything sort of began. Actually before that in UCLA at the Writers Program, when one of my professors said, you know, your writing is of a quality, you should just apply to this Pan America Fellowship. And then the rest is sort of history. And yeah. with, with my first book, Grace, it, it came as a dream um, and it was something that I was like, I have to write this down. It had never happened to me before. Um, and I remember I was holding my son at the time where, because it was a daydream. And I gave my son to my husband. I said, I have to write down what I just saw. 
and it became the opening chapter of my first novel, Grace. I would have never expected that it would be in Time Magazine, New York Times, that I would travel the world as a U.S. delegate. You know, all the things that happened, it seemed that it was because I sort of followed this call or this prompting and I just stood on the spot, like X marks the spot and everything else has sort of been magical. And how about The Perishing? What, what was the evolution of how that book came to be? You know, it's, you're going to think that I'm like this weird person who has these dreams. I am weird, but <laughs> that I have dreams. But The Perishing also came as a dream that was more, it was a dream that scared me. Um, it was, except I was asleep this time, and I woke up in the middle of the night. It was maybe 3 a.m. And I remember in this dream, I was a white passing black woman and I was in love with this Chinese man. And I knew it was LA, the late 1800s, because I loved history anyway. I loved the history of LA. And I recognized the adobe buildings. Um, and when I woke up, I was crying. This scary thing happened. And I remember just going to my computer and Googling, you know, what was possible. Um, could these people have existed in Los Angeles in this area? And sure enough, they could have. Um, and it was, and I discovered the Chinese massacre of 1871 and began to research that. And it was a nightmare. Um, and I knew I wanted to tell part of this story and the other part, but I also wanted to tell the story of the 1930s for black Americans in the Los Angeles area going into Orange County or the ones there were, you know, Orange County and there was also Los Angeles but sort of tying everything together between the two world wars, so World War I and World War II. And then she became an immortal as a way to tell the story of 1871, which became chapter 35 of The Perishing and the 1930s. Yeah, and Los Angeles itself is such a rich character in your book. And, um, and, and that part is really fascinating. And, and what the school teacher says about LA, LA is, uh, Hollywood lives here, but Los Angeles will not entertain you. That Los Angeles is so different from Hollywood. Can you talk <laughs> a little bit about the differences between the two places? Oh, definitely. I guess I would start by saying what I say in chapter one of this book is that Los Angeles has always been brown. You know, from the very beginning, it's a, it's a brown place and Hollywood came and it was the golden age of Hollywood where you really didn't see you know, brown faces and other people. Um, so it was different, but it was fueled by the city that was. Like Los Angeles should have never existed. And that was one thing that I, I wrote about. Like it didn't have a natural port, it didn't have water, all the things that you would think, you know, that a city as great as Los Angeles has become, you know, compared to Boston or Philadelphia or New York, like Los Angeles should have never existed, but it did because I think it's, and I write this in the novel, I said, because having very little and no safe place are the fuels for the greatest imaginations. And for that reason, Los Angeles would rise. Yeah, uh, so beautifully said, the city of angels and the last graph of your book is is really pretty incredible. Um, and, and, and I think the genre is so interesting that it's, it's part, it's almost a little science fiction-y, you know, when Lou wakes up on the streets of Los Angeles, it, it's so flashing to Terminator, <laughs> you know, but goes in a totally different direction. So, so do you consider it any one genre or do you enjoy mixing them or what's your feeling on that? You know, I thought, I thought that I was just writing literary fiction, but marketing said, no, this is fantasy. You can't talk about dreams, Natasha, the way that you do and immortality or everlasting life without you know, it being uh, science fiction or fantasy. So I said, okay, fine. But <laughs> so to me, you know, I walk through life and I feel like I see miracles as a criminal attorney working with both victims and perpetrators. I just, you know, and I, and I don't know if that's the right thing to say or it's, if it's the correct way to say it, but I feel like I get a front seat to witness miracles. I get to see people change, people survive some of the most difficult, painful things. Um, and I get to be part of the process to be there to help, you know, as a helper. Um, 
And all that is just so when I think about when they say, is it fantasy or science fiction? I don't know, Sandra, if I know the difference anymore. Like sometimes I'm like, of course, that miracle would happen for that person, for that family, that praying family or that, you know, so some things just make sense to me that wouldn't not necessarily be recognized by science or nature or whatever. Well, you do so much good on behalf of people like legally and the, via the law profession, but um, there's also a notion, do you, and, and I think I know how you might answer this, but can, can a book save the world? Can a book make change? Is that something you believe? I believe, I hope so. I, be, look, I mean, okay, this is, this is not going to, this is definitely not going to come out right. But look Good. at the greatest <laughs> books. I mean, look at the Bible, look at, you know, the Quran, look at, or, or any of the, the religious books or, or just books that have changed our lives that go on. We can't do that, I think, with any other form of entertainment or, or, you know, connecting with a stranger this way. Like if you watch a movie, for instance, that you loved in the 1980s. I always think of Purple Rain um, with Prince. Wow, yeah. It was the worst. It was so great back then, but it didn't like hold up. It didn't hold up, Sandra. I was like, I was like, ooh, no, no. Was Apollonia in that? I think those were the yes, Apollonia. So Apollonia. I can't think, and then you think later, or Van, like, what was that about? Yeah, Apollonia. <laughs> Yeah, and all my favorite, you know, dance movies and, um, but I think books hold up. Books hold up because you can, you know, bring in your own imagination. You're a partner with the writer for those moments and you can imagine things. And to me, that's beautiful and it's not duplicable. Yeah, and, and, and again, so much of the, what you say resonates with that Mr. Hill section in the book where you know, he said, you know, Hollywood tells the story movie pictures, the East Coast, New York has staged as an eager audience, it was Broadway, but, you know, and books. And I think this book really does it because it's so, it, it is kind of uh, filmic and lyrical and it's told in prose and dialogue and it's really a magical experience. I have to say reading it. So. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really wanted to capture L.A. because for me, L.A. is a, per it, you know, it's a character in the book. It's alive. It has wants and people come to L.A. and they'll say, oh, it wasn't a big deal. It's so far apart, you know, all these things. And Mr. Hill, I use that character to be able to tell them, you know, L.A. won't entertain you like the line you read. It yeah. won't entertain you. You know, you have to become a part of it or you're just sort of fly by night. Even if you live here for years, you can go without experiencing the real LA. So yeah, it reflects to... the emptiness that's in you. Oh, yeah, no, it's it's really, and there's so so many passages oh, and, and there's so many lines like, oh, you know, if you, what, if you've never seen a fat woman, you've missed a sunrise, like what that line is. <laughs> the glory of a fat woman is a sun. Yeah, sunrise. yeah. I wanted yeah. to bring in my girls, you know, people that I know, you know, like and maybe, you know, I asked my daughter, am I medium size or am I a little overweight? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, but whatever. But I wanted to bring in the beauty that we all have beauty, that we have diversity in sizes diversity and sexuality, neuro neurodiversity. There's so mi so much diversity in the human species, which is when when Dr. Barbara was talking about that, I was like, amen, girl, amen, you know, because <laughs> we have just hit the surface in what diversity means. A lot of us, you know, the conversations around race, we are so much bigger even than that, even though that's an important issue right now and it's something that I speak about often but our diversity is beautiful. And I just, and so I wanted to bring in as many of those characters as I could to really show the beauty of us. That's fascinating. And, and the book is so beautiful. Last quick question. I'm sorry, the time has flown. Jim Weaver wants to know just an, an author or a book that impacted you. Oh, there was a book called Push by Sapphire. They ended yep. up making a movie out of it. And the yes. reason why I love Push is because I say my first language, growing up in a Black church in Los Angeles and growing, you know, and being in seminary, even at Fuller Seminary, like my first language is, is soulful, is from the church. 
And when I write, it, that, it's that voice that I hear. It is not my voice when I'm in the court arguing a case or in front of a board or working with clients. It's a different voice. So Push, when I read the opening paragraph of Push and heard her and heard Sapphire write in a way that was true to me, you know, it wasn't refined and eloquent like Maya Angelou or someone like that. It was just very raw and beautiful and it wasn't quite the slave narrative of other pieces so i was i'm somewhere in between i'm 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 church lady you know and it was <laughs> like push was the book that gave me permission so that's why that's the most important book for me really beautifully said thank you so much natasha it's such a treat to chat with you and congratulations on the huge success of your new novel the perishing just out thank and you Yes, it, it, it's been, and the cover is gorgeous too, I have to say. Okay. And uh, last but not least, for a final, we thought we'd end up on just a holiday moment, a hallmark moment, if you will, um, and, uh, and with a dog or a puppy, which we will see in a moment. And that will be by our, one of our favorite guests, even though he, yes, he thought he was only on for five minutes, we'll see. Um, uh, w, uh, Bruce, Cameron, um, who is the creator of the family newspaper column, Eight Simple Rules for Dating My Teenage Daughter, which you know became a New York Times bestseller and uh, hit ABC series starring the late great John Ritter. Um, but he's also perhaps best known for being the New York Times bestselling author of the book series, The Dog's Purpose, A Dog's Purpose. He and wife, Catherine, which we'll see in a moment, co-wrote the hugely popular movie, which sparked A Dog's Way Home and A Dog's Journey. But of course, now he's here to talk about a special holiday book joined with Catherine and of course, the delightful Tucker. We couldn't finish the show without a puppy. So here we go. Uh, we're just seeing around like we always do. No, but this is the holidays. It's festive. It's festive. We're celebrating. Getting uh, dog hair on the couch mm -hmm. and talking about this book, A Dog's Perfect Christmas, and about Bookish, which is uh, an organization of really intelligent people. Smarter than us. Well, Not I was going to say that I, I got to be in it for like <laughs> a minute, and then they kicked me out. Uh, but I wrote this book and I can prove it because it's a picture of me on the back and my dog on the back. Tucker's my dog. So, um, Bookish is brought to us by Samantha Dunn and yes. Sandra Singlo. They are both smarter than us. Both, both smarter. Both. Albert Einstein founded it, I think. Uh, <laughs> isn't that how it started? I think it's the Orange County Register, which is a newspaper we love. We love that newspaper. And this is a great Christmas book. That's what we were just talking about. Yeah, we just sit around and talk about like how- Me, we talk about me yeah, all the time. Well, the time. I talk about me pretty exclusively. Yeah. She talks about other stuff. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the pandemic or like things that are big, but then we eventually come yeah. back to the topic of Bruce. Yeah, well, Christmas cheer and the <laughs> pandemic, that's in her mind, they're somehow melded yeah, together. Yeah, all the same. But uh, this is a book that is a great gift book. I keep coming back to the book because that's what I do. And I think that you would all, and I don't know who's gonna be watching this, but anybody who is watching this, you would love this book because it's, you know. It's, it's a great book. You know, it, it, is a, it is a family story. It's a story of a complex, uh, complicated family. I don't know about your family. Uh, that is a good description of my family. And, um, you know, uh, there's a crisis at the holidays and um, they, it, then you throw a puppy into the mix of that and then uh somehow it all works out like it, a puppy is the thing that kind of fixes christmas for this family that's in, in a bit of a crisis and it's just heartwarming and funny and you know kind of full of holiday spirit which i i like to see. i mean i watch hallmark movies i'm just saying I, I like christmas i really i can't get enough okay so like swing around and get our treat just just show two, two seconds ah, 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 there you go <laughs> that's gonna make people motion sick. No, that's like that's gonna be like they love Christmas. It's legitimate that we actually love Christmas. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Bookish, for including my book and uh, me and my dog and my and, wife. And also, please, for me and Tucker and Bruce, 
we just wish you the happiest Christmas. I know it's still weird, but it's still a great time of year to celebrate what's actually important, which is your family and your friends. Yes. Have a perfect Christmas. Have a your perfect Christmas. Dogs perfect Christmas. <laughs> and a dog perfect Christmas. Delightful, and and there you are, Samantha. Well, <clears throat> I'm back. And we we should note not everyone. It could be a dog's. Please enjoy your dog's perfect Hanukkah, a dog's perfect Kwanzaa, or maybe even right. your chicken's perfect Christmas. We are or, except all is accepted here. Or so. or your zebras, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, I'm still stuck on my safari thing. Anyway, but, but I think that Eric is here. Eric Peterson is here delightfully to tell yes. us uh, what's what's going on elsewhere in the in the empire. Thank he you is. guys tell for us. having me on. I am here, and um, and my dog will start barking at any moment. So um, I just Perfect. want to let you know. Coming up this weekend, we've got a look back at uh, books and reading in 2021. We've got. Sam's interview with Susan Orlean that's running. We've also got, uh, because it is coming up on uh, Christmas and, um, you know, and other other gift moments, uh, we've got uh, an interview with Nathan Hale, who writes these uh, great graphic novels for young people called uh, Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales. The newest one is Cold War Correspondent. Um, uh, I have read these with my kids, they're great. We also have, uh, and I'll share a link to this, um, an interview online with Andrea Beatty. She um, does Aaron Slater Illustrator and also Ada Twist Scientist. And they're wonderful books. There's a, a Netflix series uh, and she's got a great story about when she found out um, who would be involved with it. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Uh, also coming up, we are gonna have, I know what you're saying, Eric, is there enough poetry covered? And I can tell you, yes. So if you've ever thought what, books of poetry should I buy? We have an excellent poet who is going to be giving us the 10 best of the year. And so just come back for that and, um, and I'll leave you with that. Thanks guys. Thank you every, oh. And I'm still the there? book awards. I've just, that, that was fantastic. And the book awards. Don't And don't the book forget. awards coming up. So anyway, thank you and Catherine. Um, also, thanks too to our production manager, Julie Corlett. Don't forget copies of the books uh, by our featured authors are available at Once Upon a Bookstore. Uh, but but um, if you'd like to share your comments, please reach out to us um, at scng.com. Bye. Mwah.